Numbers 21, verse 1. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from the Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Keep your Bible open. We'll refer to this. Let's pray again. Father, we ask you now that you'll bless your people and strengthen them. That you convict our hearts, Lord, and convince us in the right way. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would be glorified and you alone. Help us to look and live. Help us to look at the crucified one and live our lives before you, Father. To look and live that there's, there's life to look at the crucified one. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the ministry this morning. And now we ask you, Lord, that you would help me in the ministry this evening to minister your word to your people. Lord, that your people would be encouraged and blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look and live, we want to speak on this evening. Look and live. God had done a marvelous thing for Israel. They're coming through the wilderness. And they come to King Arad the Canaanite. And he fought against Israel. And you can be aware that every time you try to walk with God, you're going to find opposition. And every time you try to step out and be different than the normal flow of people, you're going to be different. And so you're going to come against opposition, whether that's in your, your Christian walk personally or as a, a body of people like the church here, this local expression of Christ in the village. And the enemy will always want to hinder you. The enemy will always want to hamper you and harm you. He'll always want to force against you in order to keep you back from what God has planned for your life. So now it's up to us then, what do we do and how do we get through this? And many of us fall by the wayside. That is even in the calling of God and what he has on our life. Israel was called to make it to Canaan. Israel was called from Egypt and brought out with a mighty arm. And yet they get to this place and King Arad the Canaanite fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. You get sometimes whenever you're trying to serve the Lord and there's always a battle comes against you. You're buffeted in the left hand and the right. No matter what way you turn, you seem to find it difficult or hard. You see, the enemy wants to deflate you. He wants to make you feel that you're never, ever going to do. He wants to make you feel you're never, ever going to make it. He wants you to think that you're never going to get through. You're never going to make this walk. You're going to fall and backslide and Christ won't love you anymore. He's going to make you feel like that and think like that. But the devil is a liar. And he is the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. And his, his goal and his role is to upset you as much as he can in your life. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy, Jesus said. I am come that they might have life. They might have it more abundantly. We're told in verse 2, when some of them were taken prisoners, their heart starts to deflate. 
Sometimes we seem in our walk as if we're making two steps forward and sometimes four steps back. Or sometimes we're making great progress, then something hinders us and we're so many steps back, we feel a little deflated. The prisoners were taken and they didn't know what to do about this. We used to be this amount of number. We used to have this amount of power. We used to have all of these people with us. And suddenly that diminishes off. But what we have to remember is that our God is sovereign in everything. So God is sovereign in your life and over everything in your life. And he's sovereign over our church life, over our home life. He's sovereign. And even though we make mistakes, and even though we go wayward, and even though people drop off, listen, sometimes God removes people out of your life. Don't chase after them. Let God be God. And sometimes we do ourselves more harm by trying to hold on to those who don't want to know us. And what, we, what you need to do is say, Lord, I'm keeping my eyes on you. I'm not going to let the devil, I'm not going to let the enemy come in and destroy what you have for me. And people from the old life, people from your past life, they'll want to play you with, with a, a, a good time out with the boys or whatever. And, and you're having to face these things and make your decision that it is, I am following Christ. No more am I yielding to this temptation. People say, well, I can't, I'm weak. Yes, you are weak. And no, you can't, but he can. And he is in you. And if you are his, then you can through Christ. For I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, and so can you. Here we have Israel are starting to feel a little deflated. They've taken prisoners. The Canaanites have taken them. And verse 2 tells us, Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then will I utterly destroy their cities. Verse 3 says, And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. In other words, their deflation came and they realized that their future was only in God. As somebody, maybe one of your brother's sister, and you've realized you've been a little deflated recently, and you need to get to a place where you realize you can't, but he can. And your future is in him. It's not in the people around you, and it's not in the people who like you, and it's not in the people who are for you. Your future is in Christ. Your future are in him and all the promises of God. In him, in him are yea and are amen. And outside of that, we don't have anything. So we are weak and we are wayward and we are weary and we are useless at times and as according to spiritual matters. We are totally lost and without hope and help without Christ. But if you're Christ, fully yielded to him, no matter what comes against you, no matter the king of the Canaanites come against you, the devil himself, you are victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are victorious in Christ. And so the church, instead of being deflated and defeated, should be victorious and should be exalting their king, King Jesus, over the king of Arad, over the king of the Canaanites, or who represents the old devil who wants to destroy you. Here, don't let anyone or anything pull you down, hold you back from what God has for you. Don't let anyone tell you God's finished with you. For God is not finished with you. In fact, God has only started to perform and perfect the work he has promised for you. God has something greater. Canaan land was just lay ahead. Canaan land was up the road, but God was going to take them on a journey. And sometimes that journey is hard, and sometimes that journey seems cruel. And many people have been through really hard journeys, journeys of a loss of, of a lot, a loss even of loved ones, a loss of different things in our life, things of trial. It's really tried our faith so hard, and we don't know what to do with it. Tried our faith to the point where we feel like giving up, then suddenly the Lord answers our cry and hears our prayers, and we defeat uh, that devil that stood before us. We climb that mountain, and we traverse uh, that wilderness, and we make it through because he is more than able to take you through. We're trusting in the Lord tonight. We're trusting in him and in him alone, and he alone will bring us through. Brothers and sisters, let's rise up, as it were, with eagle's wings, for he said, as a great eagle carries its young ones, he will carry you if you trust in him. It's not that you're carrying the world on your shoulders. If you are, he says, throw it off. Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn of me. In other words, he didn't give you that burden. 
He didn't give you that thing you're carrying so hard. He didn't give you that difficulty. He gave you none of it. We put it upon ourselves and we come and we pray and we leave it at his feet. And by the time we get outside our bedroom door or our closet door, wherever we've been praying, we have it back on our shoulders again. And he says, I never give you that child. Give it to me and I'll carry it. And I'll bear you along on eagle's wings. Here Israel are now victorious because they're realizing, Lord, the Canaanites have taken his prisoner. In other words, they started to feel bound. You start to feel bound. I know, boy, sometimes you, you go to different meetings and you meet different people and they are bound. They're spiritually bound. They're bound for fear of man and they're bound for fear of, that they cannot worship and they're bound by the devil or they're bound by something else. They're bound by their own mindset or they're bound by their own circumstances and they feel like they're in a straitjacket. But Jesus came to set the prisoner free. He's the one who came to set you free, to break the yoke of bondage and to smash that yoke from off your neck. So here Christ says to Israel, do you want me to do the work or do you want to try it yourself? Now, when God says to me sometimes, do you want me to do the work? Do you want to try it yourself? It's usually whenever I'm so tired of trying, I give up. And he says, I never told you to do that. I never told you to bear that burden. I never told you to carry that load. I said, they give it to me and trust in me. Let's rest in the grace of God. Let's rest in his grace tonight, knowing that he loves us with an everlasting love, knowing that he cares for you, knowing that he loves you personally, knowing that his mercy is new and fresh every morning. And even as the word tells us, great is his faithfulness, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the God we have, the, the Christ we serve. And here, our God looks upon Israel and when they realize that they can't, they get to the end of themselves. They become so deflated. Prisoners are taken. What happens? They look to heaven. They look to God. That's who they should have been looking at all the time. I'm guilty of that. Is anybody else guilty of that? I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it all the time. I take things on my shoulders I shouldn't have taken. And I say, but, but Lord, if I don't, this won't happen. He says, no, son. He says, I'll build my church. It's not your church. I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And except the Lord build the house, they labor, labor in vain that build it. So sometimes, brothers and sisters, you and I are carrying loads that Christ never put upon us. And he says, give them to me and trust me. Now leave it and watch him work. Watch him do it. He is the same God of Israel here as he is to you and I this evening. And notice what it says. It says that, the Lord heard their vow. Israel vowed a vow. Verse 2 says, Israel vowed a vow. And verse 3 says, And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. You know what this tells me? Israel had no hope at all of defeating the Canaanites. None. They were a bunch of slaves that had been gathered together. They may have been quite emaciated if they weren't fed right. Maybe they were weak in body. You know, and maybe some of them were maybe wiry, as we would say, muscular, and some may have been stronger than others. But what happened nevertheless was this, that they were coming together, being in a slave market, hardly knowing how to use a sword, a spear, and a shield. And God says, you haven't a hope. Do you ever feel like that? You haven't got a hope. I do. You haven't a hope, but when you learn to look to me, I'll be your strength. When you learn to look to me, I am your hope. When you place your trust in me, I will defeat your Canaanite king and all the wives of the devil. He says, I'll do it. And when, when they did it, he did it. When they did it, he did it. What about tonight saying in our own hearts, Lord, see that thing I'm facing once and for all. I'm not going to take it back and carry it myself. I'm too tired with it. I'm looking to you. I'm doing it. Will you do it? Will you do it? I notice this. They vowed a vow unto the Lord. Here's the question. Have you ever vowed a vow unto God and deferred to pay it? Have you ever said something to the Lord and you've promised him and you've deferred to pay it? In other words, you haven't kept your promise. You haven't kept your word. Listen to what it says in Psalm 116, verses 12, 13, and 14. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Do you know what this is? This is public expression. Public expression. Now he says, the word is entering my heart. 
public expression is this, that even though others are around me, Lord, I'm going to praise. Even though others are around me, I'm going to trust. Even though others are around me, I'm not going to look at them, I'm not going to worry about them or what they think of me or say about me. I, in the presence of the people, am going to keep my word. Have you said, Lord, I worship you if you do such a thing? Or maybe a, a child has been ill and you say, Lord, if my child makes it through this illness and you bring my child out of this illness, maybe someone even on scene would say, I'd give my life to you and they've deferred to pay it. Or someone who's went cold and hard, Lord, I'll get myself back in the right relationship with you and I'll follow you, I'll pursue hard after you, but yet you've deferred to pay it. Or maybe, you, maybe you, you're, you're saying, Lord, I will do this or that or the other thing, Lord, please. Do you know in God's grace, we don't even really need to bargain with God. But rather, when we do make a vow, we should always pay what we say and keep our promise. The word here for vow is a word nadir, and it means a promised thing. If you've given God a promised thing, then don't defer to pay it, but rather pay it. And don't be ashamed in the middle of a congregation to say, Lord, I want to praise you. I'm giving my life to you. I'm giving my all to you. I'm coming back to you if you've fallen away. I'm cold in heart and I'm stoking the fire here in the presence of, of your presence, Lord. And I'm doing it in the presence of your people. I'm not going to care what anyone thinks or says because you're more important to me than everyone else around me. Ecclesiastes 5 verses 4 and 5 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Israel vowed, Lord, help us, and we'll defeat them. And they kept it at this point. But something happens. See, God heard their cries and heard their prayers. They were made to feel their own weakness, so they implored the aid of heaven. When I was in Whitewell this morning, I told them early this morning before I went there, he says, Lord, you know my weaknesses. You know my frailty. You know my infirmity, my inabilities. You know what? I don't even know how I become a preacher. Oh, what is this? This is me. Sometimes I ask the Lord, are you sure you have made a mistake? Because it's, it's not in the person, it's in the God we serve. It's in our Savior, and it's in the God we serve. And in your weakness, he is strong. And when we realize our weaknesses, we implore the aid of heaven. You see, when you're not weak, and you're not going through a trial, and you're not being tested, and you're not being tempted, when all of these things are, happening to you, aren't, are not happening to you, you're not really f look, worrying too much about heaven. You're not worried about the Holy Spirit. You're not worried about the power of God because everything seems okay and everything seems rosy and everything seems fine. But what actually happens is that we forget God and we run on without him, just like Israel did in the wilderness. And God allows things at times to come into our lives in order to be that shepherd's crook that will turn us back around, that we will see our weaknesses, and when we get to the end of ourselves, or wit's end corner, and we have nowhere else to go, and we turn back around, and there he is all the time, and we implore the aid of heaven. We're finished unless you come, Lord. We're finished unless you move. We're finished unless you bless us. I have been there. I'm sure you've been there. You say, Lord, we need you. We need you. Brothers and sisters, I need him. I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord. Here, the Lord starts them on a journey. And he starts bringing them through the country. They come to the land of Edom. E-D-O-M. Edom are the descendants of Esau who give away his birthright to Jacob for a pot of stew or a bowl of stew. And so now Israel are coming to their land and it's a shortcut through. And they say, no, you're not coming through here. Go right around. You see, it was all in God's sovereign will because God hadn't finished with them yet. God hadn't finished with them yet. They went by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And even in this now, they say, well, where's God now? Our God was the one who helped us to slay the, 
king of the Canaanites, the king of Arad. Our God was the one who was there before, but where is he now? You feel bereft sometimes. Bereft of God and bereft of his presence, bereft of his spirit. And you feel your fleshy, carnal nature. And if we are not careful, the old man and woman creeps up in us. And here, they're starting to look at this and say, what? Sure, if we just cut straight across here. God, if you give us the power, we'll defeat the Edomites. And we'll be there in a matter of a couple of days. God said, no. Where's your help, Lord? Has he not done the same before? Look at verse 4 says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged. Notice, because of the way. (laughs) Do you know sometimes, because of the way God leads us, everything in our flesh cries out against us the things of the Spirit. Because of the way God leads us, everything in our mind cries out against that which does not seem like it's intelligible. It's because of the way God leads us, it seems impossible. It seems stupid at times. Why does it have to be like this? Listen, I remember whenever I first started preaching, And I started preaching in open airs. I was teaching for a a few years with children and uh, and Sunday schools and bringing little words when they were gathering together. And then I started preaching open airs and I did about four open airs a week for a long, long, quite a long time. And then I started preaching and uh, bringing words, wee short words in the nursing home. And and in the nursing home, you know, where we're there and some of them are sleeping and some of them are, 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 are alert to you. And so... I was, what I didn't realize was I was cutting my eye teeth. I didn't realize God was making me and fashioning me and forming me. And yet I'm going, but I want that. And I want that there. And I want that pulpit. And I'd love to do it like this and like that preacher there, Lord. And that's the way I want it. I still feel like that. But the problem is he says, no, you're not ready. Not yet. Oh, Lord, but I think I can. He says, not yet. Not yet. We need to trust God's hand and all of his ways and his leadings. Maybe you have been praying for something or thinking of something or wanting something or, you know, and something's gripped you and you're saying, Lord, how much longer? This is a long way round. And it's so easy to get discouraged because of the way. Because of the way he's leading you and what you're going through. Because of the way, why does he not just do it like a click of the fingers, like, uh, like, like just like a moment in time? Why, Lord, you're, you're almighty and you're omnipotent and you're all powerful. Why do you not change my circumstance in this situation? Why do you not speak and calm this storm and heal this sickness just right now the way I want it? Why must I traverse this way? And God says, because my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so sometimes we have to, Take a step back and we have to say, Lord, I don't want to get discouraged, but can you not do it quicker? And he says, no, we must then trust. Trust. He knows better. But it's hard, I know, but he knows better. We want it yesterday. See, we live in a world of quick fixes, instant coffee, drive throughs you know, we, we, get our, we don't even have to get out of the car now and you just get handed food out the window to you. We were in the United States a few years ago, Austin, and they brought us to a drive through bank. Never seen one in my life before. You drive in, you speak to them, you, you do the bank and you don't even get out of the car. You see, everything's instant, 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 but God says, no, my timing is eternal. God is in no hurry. God is not in a rush. And a day with us, we seem like so long, but God says it's it's like a little moment in time. One year is like a moment in time to him. The day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. So God's timing is not your timing, but our timing must come under and yield itself to his timing. Israel says we're discouraged because of the way. 
Could I say something this morning, uh, this evening, brothers and sisters? Don't be discouraged because of the way, if God's leading you, but rejoice in it because he's not finished with you yet. Because he's not finished with you yet. How easy was it for people to fall out with God just because they didn't get their way whenever they wanted it, just because God didn't perform for them? The soul of the people were much discouraged. The idea here is the very heart, the very heart of the people. I'm so discouraged. You just break your heart over this, Lord, but it's only there. It's so easy for you. But I have a bigger plan. And he makes them, and he molds them, and he fashions them. And that's what he's doing with you and me. He makes us, he molds us, he fashions us. Listen, when I first got saved, I was thinking, what do you do when you're saved? What do you do at the weekend? What do you do tonight? What do you do at any night? I didn't know what to do. And I had no family that were saved. I had no friends that were saved. I did no word to turn. I was praying one time. This guy came walking past me. I couldn't have told you who he was. And, and he just happened to walk by me. And he says, I seen you in church the other night. <laughs> Sunday night. I says, I was. I got saved. He says, is that fantastic? Listen, we're going out, he says, to a worship meeting. I mean, we're a band's playing. We're going to worship. Do you want to come with us? God supplied the need for that to take me away from the world that I was already in, or I was in, I should say. But I thought, well, this is it. This is it. It's all so easy. And I had to trust God for every day. I still have to trust God for every day. You have to trust him for every single day. And whenever it gets to the place where you're saying, Lord, I can't, good. Because then it's out of your hands and in his. If you don't, when we learn to fully rest it in him, he'll take over. Did you hear that, sister? Did you hear that, brother? When you learn to fully rest it all in him, that's when he'll take it over. Here we'll find they are discouraged You see, they look and they realize they were so near before. I'll tell you what I mean in a moment. So near yet so far. For example, even when Noah built the ark, it's possible that there were other people working on the ark. I don't know why they were not, but it could have been. They had been so near yet so far and they were still shut out for only eight souls were saved. You can't be so near yet so far. The Lord Jesus had a a young man coming to him in Mark 12, and he asked, which is the first commandment of all or the most important? And Jesus answered, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And in verse 32, we're told, a scribe said unto him, well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other, but he and the and to love him with all thy heart, with all thy understanding, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, is more than all abundant offerings and sacrifices. Now, I note this. When Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Christ said, You're not far, but he didn't say you were in it. You can be so near yet so far. And of course, in Luke 22, we read of the Lord Jesus in verses 47 and 40. It's speaking, it says to Judas, it says, And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus said unto, Jesus said unto him, Judas, portrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. It's the old saying is that Judas kissed the gate of heaven and went to hell. You can be so near yet so far. And Israel were so near, so near the promised land, but yet they were so far away. They were discouraged. The word discouraged is the word katsar, and it means, listen to this, it means to dock off. You know, people used to dock a dog's tail, to dock off. 
It means also to harvest or to curtail, to dock off, to harvest or to curtail. So they're discouraged. Their spirit, which was alive after what God had done in them, their spirit, which was alive, their courage, which was real, after what God had done with the king of Arad, with the Canaanites, they're on top of the world, but suddenly they find themselves at the foot of the mountain and in the valley, curtailed. Lord, one minute we're and we're flying high with you. Now we're in the valley. Ah. But you see, when we fly high with him, you know what happens? We forget him. We forget him. When we're in the valley, we realize where we are and we turn to him. But here's the good thing. The God of the mountaintop is still the God in the valley, the same God. Here, their spirits, as it were, of elation was docked or cut off or harvested by God because of the way he had taken them. Brothers and sisters, could I encourage you tonight? See when you go home. Don't let the fowls of the air pick the word of God, the good seed out of your heart that God will sow in to encourage you. Don't let the fowls of the air come and steal that promise which God has given to you. Hide it in your heart as you get home and trust in it. Pray about it and say, Lord, you're not finished with me yet. Lord, you're doing a good work in me. You will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Canaan is not far. Our heavenly Canaan is only a breath away to many. But in this life, we must go a long way round until we reach the promised land. Don't be discouraged for the same God who's bringing you that way is the same God who will bring you into his kingdom. Same God you met at the cross. In Numbers chapter 21, in verse 5, says the people spake against God and against Moses. So easy for men and women to fall out with the Lord. And it's easy for them to fall out with the preacher. Moses See, not so long ago, you were brilliant. See, now, you're rubbish. Hero to zero. Such is the prophet, such is the preacher. And by the way, if you go into any sort of ministry, whether it even be children's ministry, you'll come up with things that one minute, you're the best, and then the next minute, you're the worst. You come against it. But you can't allow these things to hinder the word of God. God's work is bigger than you and me. God's promises are greater than you and I. And the work of God goes on in spite of you and me. The work of God carries on. Notice this. They speak against God and against Moses. The word in the Hebrew for speak is the word debar, and it means, listen, to arrange. And it's barely used in the scriptures for a destructive, a destructive sense. But here it is, and it gives the idea is they got together, they arranged themselves in order in what they would say against God and what they would say coming against Moses, Israel's anointed leadership. They arranged themselves and they were refusing God's word, refusing God's way. And because of that, they refused God's leadership and they refused God's sovereign will. Brothers and sisters, whatever way he leads me, as the old hymn writer said, where he may lead me, I will go. 
for I have learned to trust him so. His divine will is sweet to me, hallowed by bloodstain, Calvary. Wherever he's leading, go. The way, go. Walk in it. It's difficult. Walk in it and trust him. No matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it gets, walk in his way. Trust him. There's a whole lot of hymns you could sing. You know, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, <laughs> but to trust and obey you know, things with clarity and depth and meaning and spirit. They got together and their disappointment festered. Don't let your disappointment fester that you'll fall away from Christ. Don't let your disappointment fester that you'll find no joy in your salvation. The most joyful people are meant to be God's people. Don't let it fester until it becomes a range and organized and premeditated rebellion against the will of God an attack on Moses, God's appointed leadership. Don't let it fester, for once it festers, it's hard to get the poison out. It's hard to get it out. If something's festering in you, ask God to give you the grace, to give you the courage, to give you the ability to take away this poison before you go into rebellion. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, they shouted. For there is no bread, neither is there any water. Our soul loatheth this light bread. The manna, angel's food. And listen, brothers and sisters, you could boil it and you could bake it. You could do everything with it. This is a light bread. And I have to say, sometimes we think, you're not giving me enough. You're not doing enough. Maybe his presence sometimes isn't enough. It's not enough. That's light bread. Listen, I understand if you're not being fed the word and it's light bread in that sense. We need uh, bread, but this is heavenly manna they're being fed. This is like us feasting at the word of God. We're not being fed any other bread but God's word. You could go and you could say, well, you know, I'd rather hear something easy and something back patting and, and something that'll help me along and make me feel better and 10 ways to have a blessed day and a good life and, and, and so much money in the bank. And that's all right if you want to listen to that, but that is the light bread. The real bread is found in the word of God and it's the manna that come down from heaven. Sometimes we look and we say, Lord, I need more excitement than the bread. I need more pleasure than what you're giving me. God said, but I'm giving you straight from heaven. I'm giving you son, I'm giving you daughter the word straight from heaven. Let's be careful. We don't shun the bread of God. Notice this. In Exodus 7, 16 and Exodus 17, and also Numbers chapter 11 and chapter 20, they uh, correspond with each other in the same sort of time scale. But when we have Numbers chapter Numbers 20, and then we're reading from Numbers 21. From Numbers 20 to Numbers 21, the two chapters, you know, do you know what sort of period of time is in between those? From the last verse to the beginning of the next? 38 years. And you're in a hurry. 38 years. They had been in the wilderness for two and they almost made it to the promised land until he sent in the spies. And they come out with a bad report and their faith and their, their faithlessness and their unbelief caused Moses to be turned back into the wilderness for 38 years. 
This is where we're reading. He said, Lord, 48 years. See, God's in no hurry. Our God is in no hurry. 38 years has passed from chapter 20 to chapter 21. And this is either, this is a new generation now that's chiding with Moses, by the way. They all died, and now they're starting to chide again. Do you know why? I am a parent, you know that. I have two girls. Do you know why they're chiding? Because of the example of their parents. Because of the example their parents led. They saw their parents do it. They saw their parents die. Now they are getting tired of it. Instead of saying, we're trusting you. We're trusting you. We're trusting you. They start to chide. Start to give off to God. Start to give off to Moses. Proverbs 22 and 6 says, Train up a child in the way he he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We must be careful for our children will see how we live our lives as Christians and how we uh, order our lifestyle. They will think it's fine. Old George Williams from his student's commentary to the Holy Scripture said this, listen. The first resource of nature is to murmur against God. The first resource of faith is to hasten to God. I'll say it again. The first resource of nature is to murmur against God, and the first resource of faith is to hasten to God. Now, can I ask all of us, and this isn't for anyone in particular. I'm taking this in myself. Can I ask you, and I'll ask myself, and anyone else who hears, are we hastening to murmur against him because we're fed up or because he hasn't answered in the timing and the way we wanted, because of his leading, because of the way he is taking us and leading us, and it's not happening quick enough? Are we murmuring against him, or are we hastening with faith unto God to tell him, Lord, we're trusting in you? We're trusting in you. We're trusting in your providence that you will do this, that you know a better way. It's all in your will. I'm rounding this up. Thank you for your attention. Verse 6 says, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Notice this. Verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord, against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents for us. Do you know when you get things into perspective, uh, you really sometimes, if we get things into other people's lives and other perspectives, then you realize you're doing okay. I've been up and down to the children's hospital quite a lot, as you know, with the wee baby that's in there, we grace. I mean, you see that wee thing. She's doing good now. Thank thank the Lord for it. You see that wee thing, and her life is hanging in the balance by a thread. Just this length. And my murmurings, my complaints seemed to pale into insignificance when I looked at her parents, broken hearted, weeping over her. I come in, I says, Lord, forgive me. I have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for. We worry about the smallest matters and make them into mountains that aren't really ever mountains, but we're always the smallest of matters. Now that the serpents have come in, they realize when things are getting hard. I thought it was hard before. Now this is hard. (laughs) And if we allow the devil to have his way with us, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, if we allow him, 
If you allow him in your life, you allow him access to your life, if you allow him access to your mind and your thoughts and what you see, what you read, what you watch, what you say, how you act and react, what you take in and what you believe, if you allow him, the, the, the very poison of the serpent will kill you. So they cry unto the Lord, for the serpents were among them. Their first step towards their cure was when they acknowledged their condition. And this is what they said. We have sinned. Lord, we have done wrong. Jesus says, they that be whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, you don't go to the doctors if you're feeling well. You go when you're ill. And Jesus says, if you can't see that you are in need of a savior if you're not saved, or if you can't see that without me you can do nothing, that, that all of us are useless without him. He says, then you, you're not sick enough. Spiritually, this is. Because then you'll realize that I'm the only one that can heal you, he says. I'm the only one that can help. Israel get to this point and they say, we have sinned. And Numbers 21 verses 8 and 9 says, notice this. Numbers 21 verses 8 and 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass... He lived. Those who couldn't find faith to trust God beforehand now see their neighbors dying. They see them lying at different stages of their illness, different stages of the poison taking them. We see it all the time in a spiritual sense and even in a physical condition. We see it in this village all around us. We see our neighbors and our kith and kin and we see our families and in our society. People have been bitten with the poison of sin and they know not Christ and they're either dying without Christ or else they're sick or else they don't know when their next breath is going to lead them to and yet we just let them go on. We should be crying for our people, crying for our families, crying for our nation and saying, oh God, we have been bitten by the serpent and unless you come, we're all going to die. They're all going to pass away without you. Maybe in our own hearts we're saying, Lord, I've been bitten, but I need you to cleanse me. To purge out this poison that I have allowed in my life. For we see them all in different stages and we don't know when their last breath will be. Now listen to this as we close. The Lord tells Moses to make a piece of brass into a shape of a serpent, put it on a pole and lift it up and to walk through the camp of Israel with this pole. Now to the mentality, to you and I, that is, that, that's a height of stupidity. What's that going to do? How can this piece of brass do anything? It wasn't the brass. It was the faith in what God had said. That's the difference. Because later on, they keep this piece of brass like a good luck charm, like people wear a cross around their neck as if it's a good luck charm. It's superstition. It's not the cross itself. It's the Christ of the cross. And it was the Christ of the cross that you and I got saved under. Notice he says, in fact, later on, they call it Nehushtan. You'll read it later on in the scriptures. He says, this is, they say this is Nehushtan. I know what Nehushtan is. The Lord says, it's just a piece of brass. <laughs> That's just a piece of brass. No, our efforts are like a piece of brass. Dead and lifeless, but when we have our, 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 our eyes on the crucified Christ, on the living God, what makes the difference? That's what changes us. The Lord says to make this, and when they see it with faith believing, because God said it. He says, I'll save them, I'll heal them. John chapter 3, we read the Lord Jesus says, and he mentions this. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
Jesus says, I was the one who told Moses to put the brass serpent on a pole. If they look and they believe with faith, they will live. Brothers and sisters, you and I need to get a fresh glimpse of Calvary. We need to look and live. We need to look and find the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. We need to see the fountain of blood when he shed his blood and died for us. Look and live, he says. Look and live. Moses is going around Israel. He's going, look and live with the brass pole, the brazen serpent on the brass pole in his hand. He's going, look and live. All who look and live will be saved, will be healed. Look and live. And the cross of Calvary speaks to all of us and says, look and live. Look and live. If I be lifted up from off the earth, Jesus said, I'll draw all men on. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else, said Yahweh. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, he says. He pierced his hands and his feet, said the psalmist. Issa M. Hull wrote, There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinner, look unto him and be saved unto him who was nailed to the tree. Look, look, look and live. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There is life at this moment for thee. Brothers and sisters, and we, you and I as believers, can look again afresh at Calvary. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There the precious fountain, free to all the healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain.